finally, we're going to focus on a couple individual uh, treatment options for uh, degenerative arthritis of the knee. So we'll look at high tibial osteotomy and unicompartmental knee arthroplasty uh, individually here. So let's start with the question. 38-year-old man who's an avid tennis player has uh, essentially isolated advanced medial compartment degenerative arthritis of his knee, and he's failed non-operative treatment. And the question is, what's the best course of action for this 38-year-old active gentleman? And you can see the choices below. Here are his x-rays. And again, I kind of summarized it there. Isolated medial compartment arthritis, intact lateral compartment, and intact patellofemoral joint. I think the take-home message here is that this is the group where you're going to consider uh, an upper tibial osteotomy. So in 2017, usually it's the very young patients, so patients in their 30s or their 40s. Uh, and then if you add into that either active in athletics or active in, uh, in some kind of high demand uh, work capacity, osteotomy becomes a better treatment option. So high tibial osteotomy is predominantly done for varus deformities. Historically, it's also been described for valgus deformities. I haven't seen a uh, HTO for a valgus deformity in my entire career. Uh, we all know that angular deformities lead to abnormal uh, knee joint loading. And uh, you get this vicious cycle where uh, you accelerate the wear, particularly in the medial compartment is the classic description. Uh, you get a varus deformity that overloads the medial side, leads to more degeneration and more varus alignment, and you progressively go downhill from there. And that's often exacerbated by uh, an adductor moment at the knee as well. HTO is commonly used to uh, uh, address this problem in the very young patient. And I think another take-home point uh, today is that many HTOs are combined today with cartilage restoration procedures or uh, cruciate ligament procedures Again, thinking of the knee as an organ, not just as a set of isolated structures. So we're using the HTO to address the mechanical alignment problem, the cartilage procedure to address the cartilage problem, and the ligamentous procedures to restore stability to the knee joint. There are a couple uh, articles that uh, do describe the long-term outcome of, uh, of upper tibial osteotomy. I think focus on the valgus uh, uh, producing osteotomies is the way to go. So in uh, many of these patients, you can get uh, reasonably good results, particularly for the younger patient. So that, uh, that reference there is Rob Laprade's work in patients that are under 55. Uh, and I think today, most, most surgeons would say, 50 is probably the upper limit in most of the time where you'd be considering a, an osteotomy. And that's markedly different than 20 years ago or 25 years ago. The other factors, uh, I think, are very clear. The patient has to be non-obese, can't be a smoker. Uh, it's unicompartmental disease, and they have to be compliant with the post-op uh, protocol because they typically require some period of restricted weight bearing. So. In, the other side of the equation, the in contraindications, obesity, flexion contracture, limited flexion, uh, and a dynamic varus thrust during gait typically are considered contraindications to osteotomy. Anyone undergoing an osteotomy should get a long leg x-ray so that you can assess the mechanical axis of the lower extremity. Today, most people that do a, uh, a valgus producing upper tibial osteotomy are going to uh, aim to correct that knee joint such that the post-op mechanical alignment passes through the 62% coordinate measured from medial to lateral. So we slightly overcorrect the limb, but we don't dramatically overcorrect the limb uh, like was done 30 years ago. So here's a picture of that uh, malalignment. And we'll go to a, a question. So here's the classic setup, I think, for an osteotomy. The 38-year-old uh, carpenter, activity-related medial knee pain, has uh, all back grade two changes, and they want to know what's the best treatment for this uh, varus uh, deformity. Five degrees, so it's not, uh, not too bad. And uh, again, the factor is young age, higher demands, and uh, moderate deformity. 
an upper tibial osteotomy is certainly a good choice for, for that patient. Um, so the valgus producing tibial osteotomy is the uh, most commonly done and the goal, one of the goals is to maintain the joint line perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the leg. And again, that uh, correction should be slightly overcorrected, but not markedly overcorrected. So I would say here in these uh, ortho bullets pullouts, uh, this number to me, 8 to 10 degrees of valgus is too much. Uh, I think most of the surgeons today that, uh, that do osteotomies are trying to be very precise and uh, really correcting to that 62% coordinate so that the weight-bearing line passes through the downslope of the lateral tibial eminence on a weight-bearing full-length x-ray. So technique-wise, you can choose between a lateral closing wedge technique today or a medial opening wedge technique. There are certainly pluses and minuses to each one of these. The biggest benefit of the medial wedge technique is that it uh, avoids having to go into the uh, anterior compartment of the knee joint, so that helps you avoid uh, potential for compartment syndrome. The work, the primary work is away from the tib-fib joint and away from the perineal nerve. You only need to make one saw cut across the tibia, and you can have better control of the posterior slope because you can have uh, differences in the plates that, uh, that allow you to alter the posterior slope slightly. Dome osteotomies have had uh, some track record, uh, particularly in Europe, not really used in the United States. Um, in a varus tibial osteotomy, again, I've never seen one in my career. Most of the time, if you want to do a varus osteotomy around the knee, you're going to do a distal femoral uh, medial closing wedge osteotomy, uh, not a tibial osteotomy. How about uh, uh, common complications after osteotomy. Patella baja is one of the most common, so patella baja is most likely to occur after which of the following, and it's going to be after a high tibial osteotomy. And in particular, most common after a medial opening wedge osteotomy because you're distracting uh, the, uh, the joint. You're basically changing the, uh, the joint line relative to the patella, and so patella baja does happen uh, with that. You can see here uh, it's shortening of the patella tendon, and in the opening wedge it occurs because you've uh, basically raised the tib fib joint line uh, relative to the uh, to the tibial tubercle. Common complications I referenced previously: compartment syndrome, particularly with a closing wedge. Uh, osteotomy because you are doing work in the anterior compartment. Perineal nerve palsy also with closing wedge, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, 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 lateral opening wedge techniques and malunion or nonunion can occur as well. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.